I'll declare to you, God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Good morning. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you. We thank you that you have brought light into this world where we brought darkness. And Lord, that you've brought redemption where we brought no hope whatsoever, a hopeless future. Father, we thank you for the love, the wonderful love of Jesus, that he would lay down his life for us. We thank you that he would be willing to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and that you love us enough to adopt us and call us your very own. We thank you for the spirit that, that seals us for the day that Jesus Christ returns and carries us home. Help us to live as children of the kingdom of heaven. Help us to live a life of love that brings glory and honor to you, a light of light that stamps out the darkness in this world. Father, we especially pray this time of year for those that are facing... Uh, sicknesses and things that we know about and all the problems that they have with fires and with COVID and everything else. Lord, help us to be your agents, to, to live as foreigners in this world, to bring light and love to those that need it so much and help us to love one another in the body of Christ. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So if I had a title, Kim, it would be called Contrasts. Do you know what a contrast is? Right? Light and darkness, that would be one, right? It's the opposite. And just remember that as we're going along. Did you read 1 John 5 chapters? We read them all this week. If you think like I think, and I say think because we don't know for sure, that the author is John, the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve disciples, the one that wanted to rain down fire, and I tell you that at first, and destroy the Samaritans because of their sin and rejection of Jesus. And now he's writing, if it is him, and if you look at it, there's so many parallels to the Gospel of John, it seems like for sure that he wrote it. But now he's writing about love. He wrote the Gospel of John so that you might believe. He wrote 1 John so that for those who do believe, that they would not live a life that's not like Jesus, that they wouldn't miss the mark, they wouldn't miss the point, that maybe they would not run in vain because they wouldn't even be saved, but more so that you who are saved won't waste one minute of your life, that you'll live for the love of God by loving others, and you will be rewarded for it on top of that. So to set the stage... Turn in your Bibles to Luke 9. See, not 1 John. <laughs> and I'm just basically going to go over some things. You're not going to have to read any verses or anything. But Jesus commissions the twelve, and He empowers them to go and do. And in this chapter, you'll see that there's the feeding of the 5,000, which parallels in John chapter 6. Jesus says that many in John chapter 6, come simply to be fed. It's a huge, huge thing here, so I'm bouncing back and forth. Don't worry if you don't see this in Luke 9. But in John 6, Jesus says that most of you that have come simply to came to get bread to fill your bellies. You came for the physical. And see, we all need to be reminded of that because we see, we feel, we touch but we are spiritual beings, and we don't need to lose sight of the, of the spiritual. Jesus warned them. He said, you're coming just to have bread when I can give you the bread of life. And that doesn't mean just eternal life. So many Christians think 
Jesus is talking about everlasting life. Yes, He's also talking about life here and now so that your joy may, may be, be, be complete, so that you will have the, the sin in your lives stamped out and destroyed. When Jesus died on the cross, He destroyed the power of sin in your life. He destroyed death for those who believe. We have victory in Jesus, and we have it to live a life as the children of God in the kingdom of heaven now and forevermore. <clears throat> is confessing with your mouth enough for salvation? Now, I don't want to ramble down this rabbit trail, but as you're reading in John chapter 6 and, and Luke chapter 9, you'll see that Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah, the one they had been waiting for, the one that would set their people free from their sins the one that would reign physically and would reign for all eternity. <clears throat> and Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus tells him that this confession didn't come from man, this confession came from God. This knowledge is something that you get from God. But is that enough for salvation? James tells us, and we'll see this as, as, see this as we read John, that anyone who is saved will also do. It's not a requirement of, but it's something that you will do. If you're a child and you appreciate your adoption papers and you thank God for the love He had to give His Son and you thank Jesus for the love that He has and you listen to the Spirit and take your focus off the things that you see, feel, and touch but the things that are spiritual and everlasting then you will know that you're a spiritual being and you will love, you will do acts of love simply because God first loved you. And the reason I say contrast is because you've got to realize what the contrasts in your life are. Can you truly love, which are what are most of our songs are about, if you still hate? But sometimes we don't want to take love and say the contrast is just hate couldn't the contrast of not not loving be or loving be not loving it doesn't have to be hate if you hate your brother that's pretty obvious but what if you just don't like your brother if you love your brother scripture says that you should do loving acts of kindness for your brother you should care about your brother's needs more than you care about yourself so, so many times with contrast is we want to sit here and say, well, I don't hate, so therefore I'm okay. But the contrast over here is, I love my brother. If Merle was here, I could point at him and say, I love even my enemy, because we talk about that all the time, because it's hard to do. But sometimes we just kind of think the contrasts are the exact opposite. When a contrast is anything that contrasts, so if I'm to love and I am not loving, because the first thing you think of with contrast is hate. If I'm not loving, I'm not being obedient. There is darkness still in me. I am not loving, I am still hating. Because Jesus made it clear in the Sermon on the Mount that if you have any animosity in your heart, then you have committed murder. If you've had a lustful thought, you are guilty of adultery. You have broken the law. And God gave you His Spirit to indwell in you so that you know you are a child of God, but also to transform your mind so that you become a new creation in Christ. So you don't think lustful thoughts anymore whatsoever and therefore aren't guilty of breaking the law of adultery. Jesus goes on in Luke chapter 9 and, and John 6 to tell of His forecoming passion. How He is going to love. He is going to love by laying down His life. He's going to be rejected and scorned by His own children, the children of Israel, but He's going to lay down His life to save them. And the reason I brought confession out is Peter confessed here, You are the Son of God. 
How can we not follow you? We have forsaken everything. And Jesus even tells him what he'll get for forsaking everything. But as you read on, you'll know that Peter denied Jesus three times. And each denial was worse. It went from, I don't know him, to I don't know him, to I swear to you, rain down fire on me, however you want to say it, I do not know that man named Jesus. So he had confessed back here that he knew Jesus, and Jesus said that this could come from God. But he wasn't living by the power of the Spirit yet. Now, I'm not saying that confession, that's why I said I'm not going to get down that rabbit trail. Confession is not enough for salvation. But the verse says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, and if you believe in your heart, then you will do something. If I truly believe that I love my wife, I may still do things that's wrong because I'm a sinful person. But there certainly will be in my life things that I do right that are loving acts towards her. And one of the biggest things is when I realize that I've done wrong it would be to ask for forgiveness and, and try not to do that again. And how am I not going to do that? Deny myself. Let the Holy Spirit impact my life so that I realize that I am supposed to be growing and maturing and transforming to where all of the sin in my life is stamped out. Complete and total sanctification. And yeah, I don't think any of us in here will reach that point before we die, but we all should be getting closer and closer and closer to the mark of perfection. Later in Luke chapter 9, Peter and John, I'm going to focus on Peter and John because we're reading John right now, 1 John You'll read 2 John and 3 John next week, and you'll start in on the Gospel of Peter. Two key apostles. And if you believe that John, the Apostle John wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, which 2nd, 3rd John are author, authored, then John is the last remaining apostle. The last man that we know of that physically touched, felt, listened to Jesus. And he saw the transformed Jesus. He saw his hope become reality. He still didn't understand it. They wanted to build um, temples or shrines or altars to Moses and Elijah. They saw Moses and Elijah also. So they saw flesh, not just Jesus, dwelling with him. They knew the hope that they had for eternal life. And the question is... What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, I must confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart. And the biggest way to do that, the, the phrase that you hear all the time, is actions speak louder than words, correct? Well, the contrast to that is, yeah, your actions do speak louder than your words. So if you don't love your neighbor the way you should, then is the love of God in you. Now, I'm kind of summing up 1 John, but we've got more to go into. <clears throat> Jesus tells again of His love for them that He's going to give up His life to save them. He tells of His passion that He's going to have again. And what do the disciples do? They start arguing over who's going to be the greatest. And the thing is, is Jesus doesn't even condemn them for that. He tells them how to be the greatest. How are you going to be the greatest? to be the least of these, to give up everything, to love. Not just to love, but to love in actions, to, to be little Christ, Christians, to live a life that contrasts what everyone else in the world looks like. Oh, now I'm getting close to home, aren't I? Does your life look different than your neighbor next door that doesn't profess Jesus Christ. Now, sure it does. If that guy's an ornery old grouch, it might look a little different. But does it look better than the nice guy over here that does plenty of deeds for this community, his neighbors, everything else, but professes, I don't know Jesus. I don't want any part of Jesus. I'm a good person. Because the... the 
false gospel that's going around, which is the reason John wrote this letter again, the reason Paul wrote his letters, the reason Peter writes his letters, is because of false doctrine that's in the church, because we fight a spiritual warfare. And Satan wants to destroy the church, at least to make it inactive, which is destroying it, because we're supposed to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So your neighbor over here that professes he doesn't know Christ, maybe he professes he knows Buddha even, whatever. And he does loving acts of kindness. And I can give you more examples of other gospels that do wonderful loving acts of kindness that make, make us look ashamed. We are the ones whose lives are supposed to be so contrasted that we look different than the good people of this world. And we draw them to Jesus Christ. Because they say, look at the family of God and how much they love one another and the good things that they do and how they handle the troubles and the strifes and turmoils in their life, the faith and joy that they have. Because of that contrasting life, tell me more about Jesus. Merle talks about his neighbor again all the time because his neighbor professes that he doesn't want any part of Jesus. But this week... He asked him about Jesus <laughs> just because he's been a loving neighbor and that opened the door. I don't know about you, but that just, whoo! <laughs> and I'm praying that that goes to the fact that this man accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And it comes from being a good neighbor. Loving. <clears throat> What was John's response? Can we rain down fire on these towns we're going to and they, won't, they don't want to have nothing to do with you? The reason they didn't want to have anything to do with you, and that's why I'm setting the background, is because Jesus wasn't going to come give them physical bread. He wasn't going to come heal their sick. He wasn't going to perform miracles just so they could see a miracle. He was on His way to Jerusalem because He was going to die. That was his loving act. But since it, I couldn't see, feel, or touch it, I didn't want any part of it. And even John said, Can we rain down fire and destroy them? And now if you read 1 John, he's saying, We've got to love them, not rain fire down on them. We've got to look so radically different because of love and light in our life that they won't want anything but to come to Jesus. Then they won't have to have fire rain down on them for all eternity. What a contrast. The last living apostle trying to teach these dear little children in Christ to live like Christ. Because even he was going to be dead and gone soon. And he didn't want the next generation and the next generation to fade away. He wanted them to love the Lord their God with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their body, all their strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. To love your neighbor as Jesus loved. So now I'm going to John chapter 13. Not 1 John, John. I'm going to write you a few words that John wrote previously years ago in his gospel so that you might believe. John 13, 33. And this is after the faker, Judas, left the midst. There's 11 of them now that proclaim, and they will go on to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. And John writes, Little children, it follows the same pattern again. I am with you only for a little while longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, the religious Jews, the Jews in general, but even more to those that were wanting to persecute him because the crowds loved him. They did things for him. But he was in competition to the religious ones that had set all these laws for you to do that showed no mercy and grace, no compassion, no love. He said to the, to the Jews, So now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And when you read that so many times, you want to think, you can't go to the cross. It tells you right here you're going to go to the cross. It's not the fact that Jesus was physically going to the cross again to die for them. That's not where they couldn't come. It was they can't come to eternal life. No man can reach 
God. That is why God had to send His Son down and reach out for you. But you've got to take Him by the hand. You've got to let, even when He's gone, He said, I'll send the Advocate in. You've got to listen to the power of the Spirit so that you can be transformed, so that you can live and love as Jesus loved. Peter said, when he said, I won't deny you, Lord, or when he, when he professed that he, Jesus was the Messiah, he said, I will lay down my life for you. The very words Jesus is going to do. What irony in that. But yet, the next morning, before the rooster crowed, he would deny him three times, and the last one utterly denying him. He had just said hours ago, I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus said, no, you won't. If you read on in John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus gives more commands about loving. This agape, this loving works, this loving action, this thinking of my brother more than myself. In verse 15, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to be with you forever. Another advocate. Because Jesus is our advocate because He laid down His life on the cross. He was 100% man, which is one of the false teachings that John is having to combat in 1 John. Because some of the people said that Jesus Christ didn't actually come in the flesh. He wasn't, he wasn't a flesh being. And that's why He didn't really die and all these different things. All these false gospels. And John says, I felt him, I touched him, he was real. He is 100% God. The Spirit is 100% God. The triune God is working out these great plans and you're a part of it. And now you can live a life by the Spirit, which is Jesus, which is God, living in you, if you will do that. And Jesus is at the right hand of the Father now, being your advocate, saying, that I died for them, they're yours, and the Holy Spirit is inside of you, sealing you, crying out, when you don't even know what to pray to God, this is your child, I'm in, I live in Him, this is your temple, this is where you reside. And there is no place for darkness, only light. There is no place for not love, there's only a place for love. Who is this? Advocate that will be with you forever, verse 17 tells us the spirit of truth. How you can discern truth from a lie. And you have to do it by reading your Bible thoroughly so that you can study the Word of God, so you can rightly handle it. To divide truth from a lie. The Awana's motto verse. If you read on in verse 21 of John 14, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And in 1 John, he states things opposite, contrast, just like this the whole time. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. Jesus will be gone. How is he going to reveal himself? He just said it a few verses before. Through the Holy Spirit. As you read God's Word, as you pray, as you meditate on as you do loving acts of kindness as the Holy Spirit nudges you to do it. And what does that mean? I've got to deny myself first. Because <laughs> just in my busy schedule, I don't have time to do those things. Well, guess what? I need to make time, don't I? It's not all about me. Reading on in John 14, verse 23, Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Come to him. Later you can come where I'm going. But right now, God's going to come and live inside of you, which the Old Testament tells us. Verse 24, Who do, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Verse 27, Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away, and I am going to come back to you. You can count on that. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father. Verse 31, I do exactly what the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. If Jesus did exactly what the Father commanded Him, to giving up heaven, to giving up His life on earth, He said that foxes have holes to live in. He didn't even have a hole to live in. 
And then if he laid down his life, when even his best friends denied him, when the world spit upon him, plucked out his beard, uh, put ha nails in his hands and feet, whipped him beyond recognition is what Isaiah says as a human being. He looked like a piece of meat hanging in a butcher shop. And he was hanging on a cross paying the penalty for our sins. God took His wrath out on Him so that He could adopt us. Oh, what love. And John tells us that in 1 John. He says, oh, what love that we could be called children, children of God. If Jesus obeyed God's commands, aren't we supposed to follow in His footsteps? First, or John chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in His love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is as we're still living, breathing human beings. Verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Verse 18, if the world hates you, because you're going to be hated if you love God and do His will and His ways, keep His commands and love one another, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me first. It led to the cross. It led to death. But for you who are obedient and who live in the light and love as Jesus loved, it really leads to life. We know that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And the same Spirit that raised Him from the dead lives in us, seals us, and tells God we are His child. Verse 19, if you were of the world, it would love you as its own. So when you step out and live a life different, <laughs> expect Satan to attack you, expect the world to attack you also. Instead, the world hates you because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. While you're still living in the world, Jesus calls you out to be like Him. No excuses, not that you don't have enough time, not that you're not called to do this, not that you're not equipped to do this, not that it's somebody else's job. It's your responsibility. And if the love of God is truly in you, you should love to want to help your neighbor, to give up your will for God's will, to forgive them because God forgives you. I think there's a prayer that goes something like that somewhere. John chapter 16, verse 4, But I have told you these things so that when their hour comes, you will remember that I told you about them. I did not tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. Now, however, I am going to, going to Him who sent me. Yet none of you asked me, where are you going? Now, before they asked Him where He was going, now they're not asking Him where He's going. They asked him where he was going before because it was physical. Now he's talking about spiritual and they still don't even get it. Instead, your hearts are filled with sorrow, which they shouldn't be, because Jesus is dying to save us for an eternal, spiritual. But your hearts are filled with sorrow because I have told you these things, but I tell you the truth, it is for your benefit that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate, which we've already been told about, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Not your thing to do. You don't have to convict someone of their sin. That's God's job. That's the Holy Spirit's job to bring them to salvation. But it is your job to be the hands and feet, to love them as Christ loved them, so that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven. <clears throat> When He comes, He will convict the world in regard to sin and judgment, in regard to sin because they do not believe in Me, in regard to righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see Me, 
And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world has been condemned. Past tense. He has no power over you. Verse 12, I still have much to tell you, but you cannot bear to hear it. Now Jesus hung around for 40 more days and He told them more. But He's not talking about this here. He's talking about the advocate comes that will reveal it. He has much more to tell you through the, His Word and the Spirit. And that's for each and every one of us. <clears throat> However, when the Spirit of truth does come, He will guide you into... Does your say some truth? I'm in verse 13. And you know it doesn't say some. All truth. All truth. So that means there should be contrast. No lies. Right? No deception in your life. No darkness. No hatred. No not liking someone. Not loving, actually, someone. Those things should be gone. For He will not speak on His own, but He will speak what He hears, and He will declare to you what is to come. He will glorify Me by taking from Me what is Mine and disclosing it to you. The very things that motivated Jesus to do everything He gave, the Spirit will give to you as a Christian. Everything that, the Father belong, everything that belongs to the Father is Mine. That is why I said that the Spirit will take from what is Mine and disclose it to you. Did you catch that part? Everything that is God's is now yours. If you're a child of God, you receive God's inheritance. Everything. And it's while you still live and breathe on this earth. Boy, if we could just grasp a little bit of that. It's like having a bank account that has unlimited funds in it and you're writing out penny checks at a time. That's just stupid. <laughs> Write big checks because he can cash them. Walk on water because you are willing to get out of the boat. Fix your eyes on Jesus and walk even further. But don't worry if you only walked a few steps. You walked on water. The rest of the guys in the boat didn't. Verse 16, In a little while you will see me no more, and then, a little, then after a little while you will see me. Was he talking about his resurrection or was he talking about eternal life? You decide. You go read it. All these things were written so that you might believe. And they echo the words of 1 John. No, I'm not even getting into a verse in 1 John because you should have read it. If you didn't, shame on you. <laughs> but you can see all these words echoed in 1 John because now he's writing to those that believe and he's saying, remember all this. Walk this way. Live this way. Don't let someone come in and give you false teachings. And even if there's not the false teachings, don't be distracted by the things of this world. Get yourself off the throne. Deny yourself. And let Jesus live in and through you. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays. And He doesn't just pray for the twelve disciples. He prays for every one that will follow after them. And John's writing these final loving words to these churches in and around Ephesus. Verse 15, I am not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. We're still going to be walking in this world, but the Holy Spirit will take us away from the evil one. He has no power on us. You, you fill yourself with Jesus through the Spirit, there's no room for anything else. Verse 16, They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is the truth. You sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified. That means holy, set apart for God's intended service. Just like the vessels were in the tab tabernacle in the uh, Old Testament. They didn't get used for anything else but for God's use. Verse 20, I am not asking on behalf of them alone, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that Jesus Christ is God's one and only Son. 
that He came to die for them so that their sins would be forgiven and instead of eternal death they would have eternal life. I have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one in them and you and me, that they may be perfectly united so that the world may know you have sent me and love me just as you love them. Father, I want those that you, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, not here still on earth, but in heaven for all eternity that they may see the glory you gave me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, although the world has not known you, I know you, and they know that you sent me. Salvation is by believing. And I have made your name known to them and will continue to make it known, even when he's in heaven, so that the love you have for me may be in them and I in them. Now, I started in John, kind of just went over a little bit of Luke to give you background in John 6, but it started in John 13 with verse 33. And you'll see why I started back in Luke here in a second. What's verse 34 and stuff say? Hmm, don't know yet. Don't go sneak in and look. But John 13, 33 said, Little children, I am with you only a little while longer, because he's going to heaven. You will look for me, because he's not in the grave, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And if you remember in John where we just read, they didn't ask him where he was going anymore. Okay? So I'm going to go back to John chapter 7. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus took, stood up. This is John 7 verse 37. And he called out in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, streams of living water, name of our church, <laughs> will flow from within them. In Luke 9 and in John 6, when Jesus fed the 5,000, they came because they only wanted physical things, physical bread. Jesus said, quit thinking physically or you're never going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You've got to start thinking spiritually so your mind has got to be transformed. And the only way you're going to do that is by, the, by me dying for you and the Holy Spirit giving you new birth because you've believed. Then the Holy Spirit will change your mind and reveal to you and you will eat the bread of life and drink living water. That's what a child of God does. They don't worry about, Jesus tells us, what they'll eat or drink or what they'll wear or anything else. They don't worry about the things of the world. And if you worry about those still, it's because you don't trust your heavenly Father enough. Because see, with love comes trust. Perfect love casts out all fear. When you were a little child, did you worry about if you had a decent father, a decent one, not a good father, did you worry about getting fed or having clothes to put on? They might have been dirty clothes, but you had clothes to put on. Might not have been what you wanted to eat, but I guarantee you, you had something to eat, even if it was beans and cornbread again. <laughs> Sherry grew up on beans and cornbread. <laughs> and, and did say, why beans and cornbread? <laughs> At first it was manna from heaven, and then it was just beans and cornbread. But you had... And as a little child, you never thought, where's the next clothes coming from? Where's my next meal coming from? So why are you as adults questioning God if He'll take care of you? Oh, I've got to work hard enough. I've got to do this and that. I don't have time to go talk to my neighbor and be love, do loving acts of kindness because I've got to go do this. I've got a career. I've got a family to feed. I've got to put them through college. Oh, what wonderful things that the devil is lying to you. And you're missing the point, just like 1 John. Jesus has called you out of the darkness into the light. He's called you out of not loving, because that's a contrast to, to love. Hate is a form of it, but the contrast to it is not loving. He's called you out of not loving to loving. Even your enemy, because we were all enemies, even Peter when Jesus was dying on the cross. 
the one that by the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost would get up and boldly speak and not worry about anything but proclaiming Jesus. And the church would grow and grow and grow. Luke 7, verse 38, He was speaking about the Spirit, which children of God have, from those who believed in Him who would later receive. He ha we have covered Jesus being the bread of life, now the living water. We've covered physical, we've covered spiritual. Do you have the Spirit living in you? Do you? It's the first question. John says it in 1 John, and that's why when you read 1 John, a lot of people say it's about salvation. These tests and proof that you're reading in here, do you do all these things, or about whether you're saved or not? Well, of course there'll be proofs of that, but they're proofs for the children of God to know if they're living like that. But in that argument, it's going to expose whether you're really a child of God or not also. Do you have your adoption papers? Are you living like a child of God? And if you are, your nourishment comes from living water, which should spring up and flow out of you, and it comes from spiritual bread, the bread of life. Verse 40, On hearing these words, some of the people said, Truly, this is truly the prophet. Others declared, This is the Christ, just like Peter. But still others, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Let me start questioning. Some didn't want no part of Jesus. Some believed. And you got these over here questioning, feeding all of these thoughts in our heads. Doesn't the Scripture say that the Christ will come from the line of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? Well, he did. <laughs> so there was division in the crowd because of Jesus. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. There was division about who Jesus was. And then you read next that the religious leaders put it in their hearts and in their minds to kill Jesus because he was a threat to their position. Their truth came out. And chapter 8 begins with this adulterous woman on the next day. Remember her? Their focus came from wanting to kill Jesus, but they couldn't, to, well, let's kill this sinful woman instead. Isn't that okay? She's a sinful woman. But Jesus said, no, that's not okay. He's who without sin let him cast the first stone. And they left. The younger first and then the older. We'll have a little more wisdom as we get older, I hope. And only Jesus was remaining. Because Jesus is the only one who condemn, can, can condemn. And He's the only one that can save. Part of the reason that we don't go love our neighbor, even love our brother, is because we sit right here and condemn. When are we going to walk away from condemnation? I don't like her because she does this. She's a busybody. Well... I don't want to go help them because they need to help themselves. When we reach out, I was talking about the body of Christ. <laughs> when we reach out beside these walls, oh, that neighbor over there that I can physically see, look at their carport and how they live, and their kids come home at all hours of the night. I don't want to have nothing with them. Then we get talking to some other neighbors, and they say, oh, yeah, you don't want to get involved with them. And you mark them off. How dare you? <laughs> you knew I was going to get loud. <laughs> only Jesus can condemn. And only Jesus can save. And if we don't go out and live as Jesus lived, then we're condemning them. We're scattering instead of gathering. And as John was trying to say in 1 John, you better believe that you're saved, but you better live a life of worth. You might just escape through by the seat of your pants and get to heaven. But is that really how you want to live in all eternity? Oh, but He'll wipe every tear away and everything. If I have multiple children and one does well, I'm going to commend that child that does well and there's nothing wrong with it. 
And the rest of the children, if they, if they love it all, will be glad for that child, not the opposite. And Jesus told Peter when he said he was the Christ, he said, we've given up everything. And he said, you'll get a hundredfold in this life, and then you'll get more. And their names will be even inscribed on the pillars. Live a life of worth. And the most worthwhile thing you can do is talk to your neighbor, Merle's not here today, about Jesus. He just got to do that this week from a man that said, when he moved in, don't you dare talk to me because he saw his bumper stickers or whatever about Jesus because I don't want to hear about him. We'll be fine neighbors as long as you don't talk about Jesus. And instead the guy asked him about Jesus, which Peter tells us, we'll read that, that when the opportunity comes, in John 8 verse 12 once again, Jesus spoke to the people and said, I am the light of the world. We talked about that in First John. Look, see? Whoever follows me will never, ever walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to, to him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not valid, which you read about testimonies of the blood and the water and the Spirit in First John. And his answer to them was, Come into the light. You don't know me or my father, Jesus answered. If you knew me, you would know my father as well. He spoke to them of the words while he was teaching in the temple courts near the treasury. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Verse 21, again he said to them, I am going away. Remember where I started from that? I am going away and you will look for me physically and spiritually, but they'll reject him. You will look for me, but you will die in your sins. Because they would only look for him physically. They would reject him spiritually. And because of that, they would die in their sins. Because Jesus is the only one that could condemn. That's the reason the woman was there at the well the next day. It wasn't coincidence. That's why everybody else walked away. But they should have walked to Jesus, to the light, not walked away from him. Where I am going, you cannot come. These words are repeated over and over again if you haven't caught them. Verse 30, as Jesus spoke these things, many believed in Him. So He said to the Jews who had believed, If you continue in My word, you are truly My disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You won't worry about the clothes you wear, the food you eat, or anything else. And the ones who refused to believe, Jesus said this in verse 42, If God were your Father, you would have loved me. I have come from God, I have not come on my own, but He who sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It's because you are unable to accept my message. You belong to your Father, the devil, and you want to carry out His desires. Contrast. You carry out God's desires, or you do what? Well... You can say that you carry out the devil's desires, but maybe you don't want to go that far. You don't want to say, I'm a child of the devil, but John says you are. If you don't carry out God's desires, if you do carry out God's desires, contrast is you don't carry out God's desires. So even if you don't want to call yourself a child of the devil, you still aren't a child of God. Call yourself whatever you want. Jesus won't profess you that day. Your father, the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning, refusing to uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language because he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. So you won't see him later. Which of you can prove me guilty of sin? If I speak the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears the word of God and they obey them. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Crystal clear. John wrote his gospel so that you might believe. He wrote 1 John so that you would live. Okay, now I asked you before what came after 1 John 13, 33. Did you peek? Okay, verse 34, right? Verse 33, was little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. So that's why I covered all that. Verse 34, you know the verse. A new commandment I give you. That's the very next words. 
Love one another. Not go out and spread the gospel message. Not live a right life. Not anything else. The way you, I'll know, the world will know that you are obedient. Everything else that you are a child, that you've been sanctified and everything is how? That you love one another. And then he adds, as I have loved you. There's the mark that we're supposed to achieve to. Perfection. Where we don't think about anything else but others needs over our, our own because Jesus Christ gave up His life because of our needs, our need of salvation. Not physical bread, not physical water, but spiritual bread and spiritual water so we can live a life for Him now and for all eternity. Wow. If that's not enough, verse 35 says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples. If, oh, that's a big two-letter word, if you love one another. Contrast. Are you ready for some? This is hopefully a view so you can get an idea in your mind of contrast. Ah. Okay, I'm going right here. No, I'm not. I'm going right here. Safer. <laughs> okay, are you ready? This is like speed jeopardy or something. I don't know. I'm going to write down a word, and you're going to tell me what you think. Can you see it? If you can't, stand up. Okay? <laughs> What's the contrast to Christ? Okay? What else? Come on, not just Sherry. How about this one? This is the one John gives. Antichrist. Either you're like Christ or you're anti, which means you're against. You're not like. What about this one? This one's pretty easy. First grader can get this one. Darkness. Light. Darkness. All right, now I'm going to move to give you guys over here help. You can't see it all. Okie dokie. Come here, Sherry. All right, here's, here's Van, uh, Vanessa White. Did you get that? That's from uh, Va Vanna White. Sorry, that's from Wheel of Fortune. I'll get it right. How about this one? You better get this one right. I know, it was life. They just said death. You got it figured out. Okay, how about this one? Truth. False, lie. Okay? How about this one? Righteousness. Un, wrong. How about what it really is? Sin. Okay? How about this one? Love of God. Hate of God, love of the world. Holy Spirit, because John addresses this. You're guided by one or the other. Demons. Spirit of this world. How about this one? Jesus said we should gather. Sherry already beat you. Scatter. Okay, how about this one? Joy. Do you know what the opposite of joy is, Joy? <laughs> Unhappiness, sorrow, sorrow yeah. sad, grief. How about courage? Fear. Didn't John say he hadn't, that God hadn't given you a spirit of fear? How about this one? Proud. Humble. Humble. That's good. What else? Humility. Ashamed. Okay. What? Peace over here? Okay. Peace. Peace. 
What else? Unrest. Anxiety in a bad way, which anxiety probably has a bad depth to it. I don't know. Okay, how about this one? Testify. Yep. What? <laughs> Silence. I like that one. How about also it would be to deny? Because if you're giving a testimony for somebody you don't, you're going to deny. If you're supposed to testify to the truth, you're denying the truth. How about this one? Child of God. Ooh, devil instead. Ugh. And just simply not. <laughs> not. How about this one? Love. Indifference definitely can be. Okay. Okay. John's getting to this point, whether you caught it or not. Because you are a child of God, you will also be rewarded for doing a good job. Okay. Don't miss that point. Okay? The, the, the opposite over here, I'm just going to put a big old fat knot. What child doesn't want to hear well done from their father? Where do you belong? I know where you belong. Pretty obvious. And the reason I did so many, Chuck, the reason I wrote a book, is to hit home with everyone. Because that one of them might not hit home with you, but another one will. If there's one person in here that says they're on that side totally, today's the day you're going to go die and meet your maker. <laughs> because that's the day we're going to get to heaven. And I'm not condemning total sanctification because I do believe we go for that mark. If we don't believe total sanctification, we're saying the Holy Spirit isn't got enough power to take us there. He will take us for all eternity. But I am saying, I don't believe any one of you going to make it before you die. If you do, wonderful. But even Paul wrote, why do I do the things that I don't want to do? So the very moment that you say you've got this list completed, <laughs> you just failed because you've got pride. So start over. John wrote to the little children that they would be on this side of the board and nowhere else so that the world would see the love of God in them. We're so distracted by the world over the things we need to do that we forget the things we need, we must do. So maybe you need to sit down with God and take some time and say, give me more of you as there's less of me, like John the Baptist said. Maybe you need to ask for opportunities. But you need to be over here. And that's what John is writing to these little children so that they don't have any regret. They don't have any shame the day that they meet Jesus face to face. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that Jesus would give up everything because of his love for us. The things that are in our way and the way that John closes out his letter is little children flee from idols. Anything that we fashion you to be in our image, Father, forgive us for. Anything that we have affection for more than you or trust in more than you, Father, take them from us. Unite us with your Spirit. Let us be one mind living out one hope as we live differently than the world around us. As we live as Christ, we thank you and praise you for the love that you have given us through Jesus Christ, the confident hope that we have. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. And Lord, help us shine our light so that others might see. We pray this in his precious name. Amen.